Welcome to The Authority File. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. Before I introduce our next episode of The Authority File, I want to remind our listeners that we have a brand new podcast out on all the podcast platforms right now. It's called Patron Driven, and it's a narrative style podcast that brings you crowdsourced library stories where the personal meets the professional. Our first story is a five-part series that follows four librarians through the destruction of the Lone Star College Kingwood Library after Hurricane Harvey in 2017, and then the two years it took to rebuild. Patron Driven is out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, so in the next few episodes of this podcast, we're going to be talking about a new book published by the University of Toronto Press. It's called Minds Alive, Libraries and Archives Now and it features an amazing collection of essays from a wide range of international scholars. The volume sets out to challenge, in a constructive way, the current ideas around the value of libraries, archives, and those who work in them. In a fundamental way, it acknowledges that the world and the citizenry that inhabits it are rapidly changing, and it goes on to examine how the profession needs to change alongside. My guest is Dr. Tony Samick. Tony is a professor and chair at the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alberta. Tony co-edited Minds Alive with Dr. Patricia Demers, who is a distinguished university professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta. This series is brought to you by the University of Toronto Press. In this second episode, Tony talks about how, as if there wasn't enough already going on, the roles of libraries and librarians are often contested. In the, in the foreword, um, you have, um, uh, it gets contributed by Tammy Oliphant and Ali Shiri, and they note that uh, a central acknowledgement is that libraries and the roles of librarians are, are, are contested. Um, and uh, um, I, would, I would think that a lot of librarians might feel the same way. I mean, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what they meant by that and, and what the forces are that are sort of creating that content, that, uh, um, that are, that are pushing back? Sure. Um, there are so many contestations. And, and in the digital age, of course, libraries and archives, uh, museums are arguably more vital than ever. Of course, they're contested entities and commodities. Um, some, of, some of the contestation, I think we can safely say, um, sits around technologies that can be great boons or, or, or cause severe limitations uh, for different... Um, people and groups, uh, the world of information can be enlarged or it can be shrunk depending on the availability, the scope, the distribution of services. Um, wanting to have some kind of standardization in information models can also mm. cause some kind of uh, flattening in cultures <laughs> where right. we lose important things. Um, just as influential, of course, are geopolitical locations, funding climates in different sectors. Uh, not all the sectors, in fact, uh, not all the populations, as we know, enjoy equal influence and benefits. We have concerns about access, about sustainability, about preservation that affect and often determine the content, the media and technology housed within these cultural institutions and memory institutions. Mm -hmm. We think about the contestations around the social construction of knowledge and information behaviors emerge as key ways of understanding and changing the roles of these institutions and creating and thinking spaces. And um, then, of course, our Internet conference had explored these suggestive themes by attending to the central question that was back in 2016 of, you know, what are the implications for public life? Um, and I think we all may have different answers to those. So th those are some of the areas that I think um, probably um, fuel Tammy and, and Ali to use that particular phrasing and their mm. contribution. Okay, excellent. Um, and then, you know, in your in your introduction, introduction, um, you know, you and, and Pat mentioned the concept of the public, or you you bring in the notion of the the public sphere. Um, uh, you know, which that phrase itself has some some broader philosophical kind of kinds of um, connotations, and, and and that it represents a plurality of perspectives. And I'm quoting that phrase and. And, and the library's role within that. Um, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on that and, and how um, are libraries and archives uniquely suited to contain, um, showcase and, and mirror the complexities of the public sphere, um, all while <laughs> spotlighting social justice. That's... 
Sure. I mean, I mean, in the Western tradition and thinking through the, the framework of information ethics, um, you know, we can say it has roots in oral culture of ancient Greece and thinking about marketplaces and meeting places and then freedom of speech mm -hmm. um, and public thinking places and then a transition from oral culture to written culture and not just giving, <laughs> sharing right. ideas orally, but laying them down and book culture. And then, of course, Gutenberg and printing and sharing and the idea of the freedom of communication, um, which implied freedom of communicating ideas to others, not just in written word, but in a printed form. And we can think about the French Revolution and the transformation of the private libraries owned by the nobility, uh, church and common property. Um, and so, you know, underneath we, we were thinking about freedom of speech and freedom of printed works and particularly freedom of the press. And now, of course, in the network, net, network world of electronic information, we can think about freedom of access and the right to communicate. So we, but we wanted to push past this sort of maybe common elite perspective of the public sphere, um, publicly funded and private information institutes and getting at a plurality of perspectives and thinking about vigorous action bound commons works that we see mentioned in the contributions and thinking about trans literacy and supporting solutions and supporting new hybrids. And that led to contributions um, talking about things like the right of the citizen archivist. Um, you may think of the, you know, citizen journalists, even convergence mm -hmm. of information about objects in, in maybe a single system. And then of course, historically informed reconciliation uh, needing to be in part supported by reformed access to information legislation. Um, we were thinking about, records that need to be actively looked at through where we can see biases and assumptions and negations. Those could be racialized forms um, and the proactive efforts to collect and represent society accurately, um, being aware across place and time of historically through our field propaganda and things like national bibliographies that really were of repression and oppression and censorship of the state. So we wanted to recognize and articulate ethical conflicts and awareness of senses of responsibility and improve intercultural dialogue um, and shared information cultures and values and um, promote knowledge about ethical theories and concepts that um, became across perspectives and really, um, you know, poke at that elitism and poke at neutrality. Um, I don't know if that answers your question fairly enough, but those were some of the things running through our mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and there are a couple um, follow ups that I have actually on that. And and you mentioned the elite perspective on the on the public sphere. And, and what how would you characterize that? Um, what are we looking at there? Well, I would say even if you think about uh, in in recent decades, even think about you know the public library in our community and. Uh, who historically has been using that library and who may not have been using that library and more recent efforts to um, move from outreach to a kind of working alongside community. So, you know, in outreach terms in the public library sector, um, typically staff would go out into the, uh, you know, community and let people know what the ser uh, collection services programs and stuff that the library had and sort mm -hmm. of market the library. That's shifted more to working alongside the community, listening to the community. Ah, okay. What is it that you actually need? Yes. Um, and reframing and re rethinking who who the uh, who the patron or customer or user of the library is, and and sort of flipping it around. Um, so it's not um, perpetuating this idea, you know, of, of this kind of middle class, shall we say, institution that's serving. Um, a certain sector of the community that loves and supports the library, but um, addressing the barriers about why aren't other people coming into the institution and what does that mean? And um, if we don't listen to them, um, how will we know? Um, so I think the, okay. the classic case of the public library is a really good example that everybody can relate to. Yep. All right. So I was, that sounds, yeah. Okay. That clears it up. Cause I think I was initially assuming it was um, I didn't realize what you were talking about, it sounds like a um, sort of in, an internal sort of um, the professional, the profession looking at itself um, and examining its own process and how it engages with the community. I was kind of understanding it as an elite perspective, um, sort of an external um, 
opinion of or, or um, perspective on what the libraries and museums and archives are, are, are doing um, and sort of the, the patron perspective of what they think, um, you know, libraries are for. Well, and I think the internal and the external have to some extent mirrored each other in yeah, right. some of these challenges, uh, partly by historically who who has been employed by these institutions. Mm, mm-hmm. um, so, you know, if you don't diversify the staff, you're not diversifying the institutions. So, right. I mean, they do connect. Yep. And then I was curious, um, you know, you've, you've mentioned um, neutrality twice now. Um, what is, what is, you know, sort of, um, why is that a myth? And what are the issues around that? Um, it's a myth in the sense that, you um, some people naively and innocently and with good intention think that the library is a neutral place um, and that it doesn't have a point of view. Um, but the truth of the matter is their um, neutrality um, is, is the intention um, so that the, you know, the library is not there to have an opinion. The library is not there, uh, for example, to force anybody to think in a certain way. The library is there to provide as many perspectives as possible to foster, you know, that Jeffersonian principle of the informed citizenry. Um, but there are reasons why we, we may not be able to provide 360 degrees of opinion. Uh, right. One of those, one of those might be um, in terms of a collection. Uh, let's just think traditionally about books. I mean, publishers are first vetting what libraries can purchase, um, and so you know, there's already filters that happened before. There's blind spots about who's on staff and what kind of collections programs and services have historically been. Um, put forth. And then there's the challenges of funding and paywall and in the in digital environment. Um, what, you know, what can we afford and can we still afford to get X newspapers and serials and journals and so forth. And so the, the, the principle is, yes, uh, that we want to support all points of view and um, everybody should be able to find themselves through, through, through the library in one manner or another. But um, the systemic issues in society across, uh, you know, sectors, um, show up Mm -hmm. uh, within the library institution. So um, uh, it's, 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 it's what it certainly in my teaching, um, you know, we we do want to talk about library neutrality. Um, As I said, I've I've taught for many years, the course on intellectual freedom and social responsibility and librarianship. And so um, there would be a good example about, you know, do we want Megan Murphy to be able to use, you know, rent a meeting room to give a talk um, and maintaining neutrality on that um, does serve all points of view. And then other people are not happy about it. So um, it's not an easy thing to be an institution that stands for expressive freedom and neutrality. And it brings many challenges and uh, we don't necessarily um, always make everybody happy or get everything right in their eyes. So it, it is a theme that I do talk about, um, mm. certainly with our students um, and uh, through the work that I do. Um, and first first of all, it's just you know trying to show that we're not in a silo and we're reflective of systemic issues and barriers more broadly. Yeah. Yeah, I can say for sure that uh, the American Library Association, which, which um, Choice is a part of, um, has run into that itself in the last uh, year or two. But um... You just heard from Tony Samick, who co-edited Minds Alive, Libraries and Archives Now, along with Dr. Patricia Demers. Tony is professor and chair at the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alberta, and Patricia is a distinguished university professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta. This series is brought to you by the University of Toronto Press. Join us next week when we continue our conversation and dig deep to answer our very loaded question for librarians. Why bother? So if you think about in a high school library uh, with uh, trying to serve GP, uh, GLBTQ2 plus youth, um, you may have an honor system where kids can take stuff out with no tracking so that they feel safe and protected. Um, and so family members and people in their lives don't know. So um, when you 
start to look at considerations like that, the traditional metrics of counting and tracking and using the records um, becomes problematic. Um, so I think it's um, what she's trying to do is really just inform and drive um, broader attention to equity, diversity and inclusion and thinking about the, the need for more sophisticated ways and metrics of understanding where we're at and where we need to be and um, that it's going to involve a lot of listening uh, and thinking about barriers and the new kinds of barriers that, that come with technology. If you like what you hear, rate us or give us a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if there's a topic you'd like us to cover, drop me a line. I'm at bmickey at ala-choice.org. As always, sponsorship and advertising for the Authority File podcast are handled by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced by Choices Senior Digital Media Specialist Mark Dirks and Digital Media Assistant Sabrina Kofer. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. 